Magandang araw po, anyong aseo, and welcome to the 8th Philippine-Korean Studies Symposium. I am Jem R. Javier from the UP Department of Linguistics, and I will be your moderator in the first day's morning program. For more than a decade now, we have witnessed how PKSS has been able to evolve, adapting to various and drastic changes in terms of research themes, formats, and platforms. We are delighted to welcome our participants joining us in the safety of their homes through Facebook and YouTube live stream. The 8th PKSS is co-organized by the UP Korea Research Center and the UP Department of Linguistics and sponsored by the Korea Foundation. On April 27, 2016, the University of the Philippines launched the Korea Research Center with the support of the Academy of Korean Studies or AKS Korean Studies Promotion Service, aiming to provide Filipino scholars and researchers with opportunities to widen their interests in Korean studies. The center hopes to be a venture for students and professionals to produce meaningful comparative research and to promote collaborative partnerships among Korean and Philippine institutions. The center serves as a, as a university-wide hub that helps promote and develop Korean studies in the university and the country. It promotes interdisciplinary and intercollege research and educational activities on Korean studies 
as well as facilitates the training of the next generation of Koreanists in the country. Meanwhile, the, Kore the UP Department of Linguistics is an academic institution under the College of Social Sciences and Philosophy, University of the Philippines, Diliman, which is distinctly focused on the scientific study, preservation, and promotion of Philippine languages and dialects through teaching, archiving, research, and publication. It's also mandated to use its um, research expertise to address language issues in the country. Aside from Philippine linguistics, the department is also recognized and as, as an expert in the teaching of the national languages of Asia and is designated as a center of excellence in foreign languages by the Philippines Commission on Higher Education. This year's installment of the PKSS is also being conducted in celebration of the centennial founding anniversary of the Department of Linguistics and the 11th year of collaborative and fruitful partnership between the University of the Philippines Department of Linguistics and the UP Korea Research Center. We also wish to thank our followers and supporters and wish to express our gratitude in making events such as this happen. We wish to greet everyone and hope all will have a fruitful learning experience today in, and in the next two days of the PKSS. To formally begin our program, let us virtually welcome Dr. Maria Bernadette Abrera, Dean of the UP College of Social Sciences and Philosophy, who will deliver her welcome remarks. Greetings to the distinguished guests, participants, and organizers of the 8th Philippine-Korean Studies Symposium. This year, the theme is on Korean public diplomacy in the time of pandemic, focusing on Korea-Philippines bilateral relations. The COVID-19 pandemic brought new dimensions of Korean public diplomacy to light, particularly in its relations to the Philippines. Korea's success in managing the pandemic had the positive consequence of enabling it to extend a helping hand to other countries, showing how responsible governance will reflect on international relations and public diplomacy. At the start of the pandemic, South Korea was one of the first countries that offered humanitarian assistance to the Philippines' We Heal as One campaign donating masks, testing kits, and vaccines. These donations were complemented with monetary assistance and loans to the Philippine government. We saw photos of the Korean-made walk through COVID-19 testing booths and the sewing centers in Bulacan that produced face masks and PPEs through the support of South Korean agencies. In 2021, in the midst of the pandemic, the foreign ministers of the Philippines and South Korea reaffirmed the areas of economic cooperation between our two countries. These are a few outstanding examples of the strong commitment towards strong bilateral relations. The South Korean embassy has used a Filipino concept to encapsulate its response to the Philippines during the pandemic. Bayanihan. This refers to the strong spirit of community among peoples regardless of status and background. As we continue to engage one another amidst new challenges and circumstances, the pandemic has given us new manifestations of Bayanihan on a global scale. Indeed, may the spirit of Bayanihan remain strong as a driving force in building up Korean public diplomacy not only in the Philippines, but to the world. Mabuhay and congratulations on the 8th Philippine-Korean Studies Symposium. Thank you very much, Dean Abrera, for the warm greetings. At this point, let us welcome Dr. Kyung ming -be, OIC Director of UP Korea Research Center, as she gives a brief overview of the three-day program. Um, so uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone who uh, joined us uh, 
from from every part of uh, the country or even uh, from outside uh, the Philippines. Um, we are kicking off uh, the first day of uh, uh, the the eighth uh, Philippine Korean Studies Symposium today, and then uh, two more Saturdays uh, we will have uh, some exciting lectures and then uh, research presentations. And uh, on the last day, we also have uh, prepared a special workshop uh, for uh, Korean as a foreign language educators uh, workshop. Um, so uh, today, uh, especially, we are very delighted uh, to have uh, Dr. Changun Lee uh, from the KDI School of Public Policy and Management. Uh, and um, we are very much aware of uh, KDI School uh, to produce uh, uh, qualified uh, postgraduate students, uh, including uh, lots of Filipino students. And um, we are also very uh, equally excited uh, to meet uh, our uh, discussant and other students who virtually join us um, to, to join and to listen uh, to the lecture. So in the afternoon, uh, we also have a student presentation um, who are uh, both uh, linguistics uh, alumni. So uh, we have prepared a pre-recorded video presentation, and then uh, two of them will join us uh, during the live session. And then um, uh, in the second uh, session, we also have uh, two um, uh, UPKRC um, uh, core research project. Uh, so this uh, research project project has been running for almost one year. So uh, we are very um, exciting, uh, excited uh, to share uh, what has been uh, preliminarily found out by uh, our researchers. So uh, that uh, would be about today. But uh, next week, uh, we also have uh, another keynote speech and then uh, another research presentation and also um, uh, two other groups of uh, linguistic students who will share uh, some interesting uh, research uh, they have just uh, studied uh, during this uh, very semester. So uh, please uh, stay tuned uh, for next Saturday and then also uh, the, the last day of PKSS for the special workshop. Uh, you can always um, join, uh, you can always uh, access uh, UP Department of Linguistics um, website and uh, UPKRC Facebook and Linguistics Facebook uh, for any updates and any news. So uh, enjoy today and uh, hopefully uh, we can have a fruitful day, uh, everyone. 감사합니다. Thank you, Dr. Be, for sharing the information. Before we begin our program, we would like to remind our viewers of some house rules. You may send your questions and comments to our panelists throughout the event in the comments section of the official uh, Facebook page and YouTube channel of the UP Korea Research Center. The questions and comments will then be read during the open forum and will be addressed by our guest speakers. We're also reminded that the whole forum is a safe space and thus will not tolerate any form of bullying and trolling, academic or otherwise. The organizer reserves the right to remove those who will create any disruption in any part of the program. To those of you who are tuned in live, you may claim your certificate of attendance after you have accomplished the evaluation form, the link of which will be provided throughout this session. The Google form will be open until 5 p.m. today, January 21, 2023. We would also like to inform you that this event will be recorded and uploaded to the official UPKRC Facebook page and YouTube channel. Before we begin with the first keynote speech, let us get to know our speaker. Our first keynote speaker is an Associate Professor of Economics at the Korea Development Institute School of Public Policy and Management. His research centers on economic history, labor economics, and applied microeconomics. His latest research projects include the impact of the minimum wage introduction on the characteristics of new establishments evidence from South Korea, job re reallocation in Korean manufacturing 1984 to 2014. Prior to joining KDIS, he served as assistant professor at Yonsei University from 2018 to 2020 and associate fellow at Korea Development Institute from 2015 to 2018. He holds a PhD in economics, which he obtained from the University of Michigan, USA. 
to deliver his keynote speech titled Rise of Gay Culture, History, and Economics. Let us all welcome Dr. Lee whenever you're ready, sir. Okay, uh, so can you hear me well? Just, yeah. Just to yes, make sure, sir. can you, okay, great. Uh, so let me share my screen. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to the symposium. Uh, as you said, uh, our school and I have have a huge interest in the interaction with uh, the, the uh, Filipino uh, colleagues and we have many uh, students from uh, the Philippines. So uh, I think this is a great honor to me. Uh, and I was thinking about what to present and what to uh, what kind of stories to tell. And I uh, decided to uh, talk about uh, the uh, Korean culture, especially the uh, recent uh, Korean su successes. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, uh, make it kind of distinct from other many uh, similar kind uh, lectures about uh, K culture. And because I'm an economist and because I'm an economic historian, I thought that I could uh, frame the experience of Korean uh, cultural rise and uh, give you uh, some uh, important insights that possibly uh, be uh, applied to the Philippines or other countries. So here's, uh, here's the title of this lecture, The Rise of K-Culture, History and Economics. So the uh, fundamental questions are like this. Uh, we know uh, the uh, notable uh, examples of uh, the Korean cultural success, like BTS, uh, movies, Parasite, and drama, Squid Game, and game like uh, video games like uh, Battlegrounds. So there are many stories about uh, the success, and there are many praises, and there are many uh, criticism. But uh, I don't think that we have many uh, some structural or systematic analysis of how Korea uh, got to this point from uh, a much more a darker uh, history. So here are questions I would like to uh, present and try to answer. So what explains the uh, Korea's rise in cultural industries and what are the lessons to other uh, countries? So uh, I assume that you have a good knowledge of uh, Korean history, but I, I wanted to uh, repeat uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a more kind of condensed way, just to give you a sense of how uh, uh, we uh, started and what kind of uh, important uh, change moments uh, we had in, in history in terms of cultural uh, industry. So uh, we think that our modern history started in 1945 when Korea was liberated from the uh, Japanese colonial rule. And we had a war, as you know. And 1960 was an important year because there was a, a student revolution in April uh, that led to the uh, 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 pushing uh, President uh, Rhee, who was our, our very first uh, president. And, uh, but, but the uh, period of the democracy was quite short because uh, General Park uh, uh, staged a coup in 1961, and he took the power, and under his rule, uh, we know that Korea uh, pursued industrialization, and... Uh, he also strengthened uh, the authoritarian rule. So uh, as I explained, you can imagine how the uh, atmosphere, cult atmosphere, especially uh, regarding culture, uh, was in, in, in that time. And the uh, moment of change uh, came in 1987, uh, when there was mass demonstration uh, that uh, ultimately led to the full democratization that uh, so many Koreans uh, uh, dreamed of. And in, 10 years later, in 1997, there was the first peaceful democratic uh, power transfer to the opposition party. And at the same time, we had a very serious economic recession. You know, there was a serious uh, uh, crisis in many uh, Asian countries, including Thailand, Hong Kong, and, and, and Korea. So that, that's called uh, the Asian financial crisis. But in Korea, it's also known as the IMF crisis because Korea, the Korean government uh, requested the emergency fund from IMF, and that resulted in several fundamental uh, reforms uh, in the labor market, in corporates, and 
corporate governance and in uh, the financial sector. So the new president was Kim Dae-jung and, and he uh, pushed it, uh, the IT uh, drive. So uh, that administration built a cyber in infrastructure, which is broadband uh, mainly and uh, promoted IT industry. And that's when uh, the Korean culture industry started taking off. And 2002, uh, that year is remembered as uh, the huge success in the uh, Korea Japan World Cup because the Korean national uh, team reached a uh, semifinal. But at the same time, uh, we know the uh, kind of Red Devils, uh, you know, they, uh, they held kind of mass, you know, uh, the supporting uh, event that uh, was kind of mobilized through the net. And there was the presidential election. And that showed quite a, a generation shift because the, uh, uh, the, the new president uh, gained huge support from young generation. And they mobilized uh, online movement. And uh, they, that kind of was a huge power in changing the mainstream. So culturally, that, that year was quite important. And after a couple of years, uh, in, the nine, in the 2010s, Korea uh, started becoming a true uh, global player, starting with IT. You know, Samsung smartphone, TVs, and others. But uh, that was not the only thing uh, Korea, Korea achieved in that decade, because we started seeing some impor important uh, cultural uh, achievements that went beyond early Han Hallyu, right? Hallyu is uh, uh, interpreted uh, as kind of a Korean wave, but the original Korean wave was uh, remembered as a couple, you know, Korean dramas like Winter Sonata or some Korean uh, idol pop uh, stars like Sonia Shide, but, but they were more like sporadic. And uh, that could have uh, ended uh, with, uh, I mean, just 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 a one-time uh, heat, right? But uh, in, in that decade, we achieved kind of more sustained uh, success, which uh, draws uh, many people's uh, attention and, and global attention. So my goal is to uh, like uh, interpret uh, the process of moving from the kind of, uh, much darker years under authoritarian rules and to more colorful and more dynamic uh, cultural uh, uh, atmosphere now. So here are the key questions and I would like to introduce some uh, main framework we would like to employ. Uh, and my motivation is uh, that, I mean, narrative is important. We need to understand the uh, general history, but our goal is not to uh, remember what happened when. Uh, we want to rather understand what enabled uh, Korea's success. So because I'm an economist, I, I would like to employ economics because I believe that economics helps us identify some important questions and trade-off we are facing. We want to promote manufacturing. We want to promote IT. We want to promote culture. But we are facing trade-off, and that's the very first notion uh, all economists have. Right? We have to make a choice. So what kind of choice? The choice between supply and demand, because uh, economists uh, would like to frame everything in, uh, in the uh, supply, or de supply and demand framework. So if we have to make a choice, I mean, we want to uh, boost both supply and, and demand. But if we have very limited resources, which side should take priority? Should we promote demand by like giving money, giving vouchers, or should we promote supply side by giving some subsidy uh, to the creators or producers of cultural uh, content? That's a very difficult question. And in reality, we uh, are, I mean, between the two uh, extremes, right? All countries uh, choose like 60 to 40 or 70 to 30 uh, kind of balance. So it's a matter of balance. So. I uh, want to uh, explain how Korea uh, changed it uh, on that horizon. And uh, my main argument uh, is like the turning point in Korean culture industry uh, was uh, like the, the late 1990s and early 2000, uh, when the focus uh, shifted from uh, demand to supply 
But now things are changing again, and now we are uh, facing uh, the situation where we need to empower and give more power to consumers. So that's that's one of the main stories. And the second question is about government or market. Well, actually, uh, this is not um, limited to culture or culture industry. This is very general question. Uh, maybe because of recent uh, cultural success, uh, there is growing uh, interest in the Korean economic and Korean, uh, Korean uh, socioeconomic uh, development. And they ask whether the Korean success was driven by the government or public sector or by market or individuals. Man, there's no single right answer. But uh, I think the consensus uh, uh, has been uh, changing. I mean, in early years, people uh, uh, focused more on the government because, I mean, the uh, well-known facts about Korea was like a uh, strong leader uh, planning and implementing uh, development. And there were uh, strong, strong leaders in business as well, right? But uh, recent uh, interpretations uh, give endless equal uh, uh, weight to the role of market. Man, the Korean uh, uh, the Korean economy was more responsive and more dynamic than people have uh, previously uh, thought, and uh, many kinds of demand, like international demand or domestic demand, they uh, facilitated Korean producers both uh, manufacturing uh, service and uh, including cultural uh, industries as well. I mean, the, the, the demand pressure made them more uh, competitive uh, on the international market. So when it comes to culture, uh, the, the government side, like who advocate the government intervention or support, they argue like there are market failures, which means that culture goods are uh, undersupplied. People want more cultural consumption, more cultural experiences, but uh, private sector producers have less incentives because they can't make enough money out of uh, cultural events. So that's why the government should give subsidy or provide cultural goods directly. And they also justify the government intervention because they believe that there are much more values in cultural goods uh, than just money, right? They say that culture is not only about money. Uh, it uh, strengthens the social cohesion and uh, cooperation. I mean, th there are many good things, right? So they uh, advocate the Korean, uh, the, the government should support uh, culture. And that explains the uh, Korean success in culture. And there's another, uh, there's the other side, like, no, we should give enough power to consumers and let them choose what they want. Look at history when the government took power in uh, providing cultural goods. I mean, they were not welcomed by consumers and consumers rather want to watch Hollywood movies, right? So we don't know which one is uh, closer to truth. I think uh, it, it changed over time, right? So even though this is a very difficult question to answer, uh, we want to frame the uh, evolution of Korean culture industry uh, development so that we can think a little more systematically and draw some practical lessons for policy, right? And to do that more effectively, even though this is about Korea, I would like to introduce a, some, some stories about Europe and the US where the modern cultural industries emerged at first. And I, I believe that uh, that could help us to understand whether Korea was an exception or not, right? Well, one of the easiest ways to explain the Korean success was like, well, Korea had a great leader, Korea, and the Koreans were diligent, the Korean was smart, and they, or they were simply lucky, right? I mean, I, I, can, I can do that, but it doesn't give us a useful lesson, right? If that's true, then other countries that have no uh, uh, effective leaders or a low education level, they, they have no chance, right? But that's not uh, what we want from the Korean case. So 
I've always emphasized that we should think everything in the comparative uh, perspective. And we have to do many uh, thought experiments to find out what we can do in the current uh, environment. And uh, we should have some you know, realistic uh, objectives so that policies can be more effective. So that's the motivation. So let me um, uh, explain just a little bit about uh, the economics of culture. So uh, even though I, I uh, put the title like theory and history, I, I'm not going to use any math. So uh, please uh, feel uh, a little uh, easier. <laughs> and uh, there's a model uh, in labor economics. And labor economists uh, tend to think that uh, we have limited resources, which is called time. We, uh, we have 24 hours. Everyone has 24 hours per day. And our problem is to choose how many hours we will work and how many hours we will not work, which is called leisure. And because to watch movies and to, uh, uh, to attend um, concerts or to play games, we have to, we, we need a leisure time. So this is directly related to the cultural uh, consumption. And the main hypothesis is that, man, we have choice between work and leisure and leisure time depends on our income I mean, which is uh, wages because most of us are workers right uh, wage earners and in economics that's also called as opportunity cost and preference so the uh, main story is like what happens when a country uh, develops economically which is when uh, income increases overall. So the economic theory predicts that when we have more income, it's quite easy to think that oh, we want more leisure, we want more entertainment, so the culture industries will grow naturally. Right? But that's not the case. It's quite conditional because when leisure or entertainment is expensive, even though we have more income, we can't afford anything, right? And we should work more to buy that expensive uh, entertainment. But when le leisure is cheap and when entertainment is abundant and entertainment options are abundant, we can choose work less and enjoy more, right? Because working less can give us the same income, right? So that's how the demand, I mean, uh, workers or consumers or household and the supply interact. We need income, but we need uh, also time and we need affordable choices, right? So what we can see from the history of the West, I mean, Europe and the, uh, and, and the US after industrialization, I mean, be because of the success in industry, uh, they earn more income. But if that's the case, we uh, must have seen a sharp rise in entertainment right after the Industrial Revolution, so in the 19th century. But we didn't see that. In the 19th century, still, entertainment was allowed only for you know, some uh, prestigious uh, classes. In the US, that was called leisure class, right? Why? Because labor entertainment was expensive. And why was entertainment expensive? Because that's labor intensive. Many people have to think about, you know, performance and music, and they have to be on the stage at the same time. So it, it costs a lot. So the price is high, and that's why only a few people could afford that kind of uh, expensive uh, cultural goods, right? So this history shows the importance of supply side factors, but uh there's another side note because as i said income rose first but it didn't lead to the reduction in the work hour so let's look at the data so these two uh, graphs shows the uh so, so the left hand side graph shows the reduction in uh, uh, weekly work hours of the western countries so you can see that that happened between 1920s and 1940s 
Before that, people used to work 60 hours per week, which is hard to imagine from uh, by modern standards, right? But even in the US, even in Germany, even in France, the major uh, reduction in uh, work hours happened after the First World War, right? What does that mean? Uh, it means that uh, productivity growth uh, was needed to reduce uh, work hours because it has to con convince employers that uh, less work hours are enough to produce the same, right? And the right-hand figure supports that hypothesis because we have a negative relationship between productivity and annual hours of work. So when you uh, can produce more uh, with less hours, employees will be happy uh, uh, to propose uh, less work hours, right? But that's not the only thing. Uh, there, there, there were uh, institutional changes as well, right? Because of the war, uh, workers had uh, much greater bargaining powers and they demanded, they demanded for shorter work hours, right? So finally, the demand side conditions were fulfilled at this point, right? Even though they had some money before, they didn't have uh, enough uh, uh, leisure hours. And at the same time, and they didn't have many cheap uh, leisure options. But I mean, uh, in early 20th century, they finally have more time to enjoy. And now they uh, had something to enjoy at a cheap price. So uh, let me explain just a little bit more about this. I mean, cheap uh, options of cultural uh, consumption. Uh, in the economics of culture, there's a famous uh, hypothesis uh, proposed by an economist of William Bomol. So this is called Bomol's coast disease. Coast disease. So he thinks that uh, the cultural production is plagued by uh, a coast burden. So uh, it can't grow, right? And it uh, I mean, limits the economic growth of, of the overall economy. And he took an example of orchestra. So let's think of an orchestra. I mean, uh, because the economy grows over time, people, I mean, workers would demand higher wages. I mean, at least they have to uh, live up with rising prices, right? So it's quite natural for them to demand for higher wages. So we can imagine that labor costs will increase over time, right? But the number of performances is limited, right? Uh, I mean, let's think of a symphony that lasts like one hour, right? We still need one hour and we can't increase dramatically the number of performances to make more money. It's impossible, right? So that means productivity so the number of performance per worker is doomed to decrease, right? I mean, we have, we have to pay more to uh, players, but we can't have uh, more performances, right? And he goes on to argue that all service industries share the same characteristic, right? So that, that uh, justifies public support or private sponsorship. Because of the cost disease, I mean, the, this kind of cost burden, I mean, we can't produce more, but we have rising uh, labor, labor costs. So private sector people have no incentives to uh, make cultural content or provide uh, orchestra performance to the public, right? So the argument goes like the government should step in or some notable, you know, uh, wealthy families should sponsor uh, art museums or uh, classical music, something like that. Actually, we have seen that over history, right? So in the West, the, uh, the, 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 the fine arts and music, they have been sponsored by uh, wealthy families, influential families, and now the government pours a lot of money into the market, right? But History uh, and and this in the 20th century shows something different, right? What is that? Cultural industries have expanded quite fast. We have we know everyone knows 
how powerful is uh, how powerful Hollywood is, and everyone knows how influential the Billboard chart or uh, Mnet or other uh, companies are. Right? So this contradicts Bomo's cross thesis, right? And and what and and then why uh, we see this kind of uh, contradiction, and when uh, did some changes happen to? Uh, disapprove uh, Bomo's cause thesis. Uh, it was early 20th century. So I'm saying that in the early 20th century, every condition uh, was met because people had more time to enjoy. And now finally they have uh, some affordable uh, uh, choices. And, 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 that's, uh, and this slide is about that story because before uh, uh, 20th century, in the 19th century, live performance, like or uh, orchestra performance, operas, and many other uh, live performance, and that was the main form of entertainment. So even though more rail and more, you know, uh, steamship that promoted travel, right? So performance groups could travel to different uh, locations, and they could pr uh, they could offer some performance, but um, it was impossible to reach every small region of like Germany, France, or the US, right? So only big cities and good theaters in big cities could accommodate uh, uh, the best uh, performers and they could accommodate more audiences because they had better facilities. So the vast majority of people were excluded from entertainment because they didn't have any access to good theaters, right? And suppose you were born in a very small rural town in the US. Of course, you can travel to New York, you can travel to Chicago, but it costs too much. So you choose to watch a local uh, you know, play, but you uh, become much more disappointed because the quality was so low. So you, you have two choices, Go, going to New York to watch best performance or stay in a rural town, uh, being satisfied with small, small, small and low quality uh, performances, right? And you can imagine like, I would like to choose the first, but I don't have enough money, right? And that's why uh, the uh, cultural uh, consumption and production were kind of trapped in an equilibrium uh, that is, I mean, dictated by the Bomo's cost thesis. But the moment of change came as motion pictures were invented and motion pictures were uh, commercialized. Because the, 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 the key change was that movies can be reproduced, right? Before that, before that, before motion pictures, if you, are, if you live in a, a rural town, you have no access to live, high quality live performance. But if you record it and send the film to rural towns, and if you uh, play the recorded video, people there, people in rural, rural villages, they could watch, they, could, they can enjoy the same uh, type of uh, performance of the same quality. And many people can do that at the same time. Now, much greater market was opened. So quality was standardized and entertainment became kind of tradable service. I mean, by service, we usually mean that production and consumption should take place in the same place at the same time. Like if you go to coffee shop, the, uh, the, the, the barista will brew coffee and give it to you, right? That's typical service. That should take place in the same place at the same time. But for this kind of entertainment, production and consumption can be separated. You don't need to go to like a small town in Indiana to produce performance. You can be in Hollywood, you uh, take advantage of the great uh, infrastructure there and make very attractive movie and send the film to a rural town in, in Indiana. That's enough, right? So that provided big chance for entertainment, for culture to industrialized. Now we take it uh, for granted, like 
you know, cultural industry is quite, I mean, popular term. But when he go back hundreds of years uh, back, and then nobody knew uh, the term cultural industry. It was not industry. That was something to be sponsored by wealthy family or supported by the uh, government, right? But because of um, these things, entertainment and culture could be industrialized. And people saw similar changes in music because radio uh, was uh, supplied and everyone could enjoy music because radio stations uh, aired uh, commercials, but they could, uh, they could play music for free, right? So as a result, the music industry started uh, growing, right? So that's an interesting story, but what we need to take away from this episode is that we find very strong complementarity between ICT or IT, information and communication technology, which is radio back then and now internet, right? And culture, right? For culture to be an industry, we need to take advantage of technology. That makes it possible, uh, like separating production and consumption and mass producing entertainment. And Korea's success is based on this feature because if if we are still living uh 19th century korea has no chance right how can we uh promote uh the production of and great plays and how we can persuade uh the consumers in the us it's impossible right basically we are living in a period after uh, motion pictures which means that we have better access to the global market, right? And so once we can convince the global consumers like Squid Game, uh, Parasite, uh, Battleground, BTS, we can have huge success, right? So to this point, maybe our impression is like, oh, history has evolved, like in the way that uh, giving, the, the, in the way of kind of giving more opportunities to kind of latecomers like Korea. But we know that that was not the case. So probably we think that Korea was an exception, right? But let's see. Uh, I explained uh, the evolution of entertainment industry in the US uh, until the World War II. But after World War II, as cultural, in cultural industries uh, developed more, there were some other uh, notable cha uh, changes. Uh, one of them was quality race, right? Because uh, consumers in rural village, they have access to the best films, right? So, I mean, no local uh, producers could enjoy their monopoly over small areas. I mean, everyone has to uh, compete over the same market, over the same uh, global or national market, right? So there's a quality race. You have to produce the best movie. So you have to recruit I mean, star uh, actors and actresses, and you have to invest more. But even though it costs a lot of money, and even though the investment is fixed, but if you win the race, you have bigger rewards. Right? So you enter another stage, and we are still living in that uh, 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 market environment. Right? So uh, there was quality race, and uh, that the sports the sports star market uh, opened up because you know let's think of football soccer right man it's not related it's not limited to Southeast Asian uh, people actually that is the case for Koreans as well man we have our own league which is K League but uh, we prefer watching British Premier League to watching K League right so uh, why because that's the league where the best players play. So the uh, technological uh, development and industrial evolution, they indicate that it becomes more and more difficult for a catching up country or a developing country to develop their own cultural uh, market, uh, as we can see from the you know, uh, uh, soccer or football case. Right? And that's also the case for music, movie, game right because 
I mean, people listen to, uh, you know, uh, American pop and now uh, K-pop, right? But even though they have their uh, own singers singing in their own language, right? So, and uh, because uh, cultural products are all unique and they're made in a short time and you have to combine many factors, like you have to recruit audio producers and casting uh, experts and legal service. So the culture industries tend to concentrate in a few large global cities such as New York City and London. So what are the lessons? The lessons are like mass production of culture, increase the profitability of culture and entertainment. But at the same time, it became a winner take all uh, market. So you need to invest huge money in quality even though you have no guarantee that you can reach some stage right? and you need strong infrastructure. So in this situation, we can't expect developing countries to have all these conditions, right? So what are the lessons from Korea that used to be a developing country and, uh, and a country that had none of this, right? So I think that's uh, the value of Korean case. I mean, I mean, we can't replicate Korean case in every situation because all countries have different uh, situations and environments. But by having a close uh, observation of the cultural, Korean cultural industry's history, I think we can find some meaningful uh, implications. Right? So let me get into the Korea case finally. So uh, even though we know that there were some stars and there were uh, great uh, movies and songs, but nobody, I mean, few people uh, really know much about the uh, Korean culture industry before 1990s. And even though it might be a little dangerous for me to generalize too much, I would say that Korea, uh, in Korea, culture has uh, no uh, industrial potential. Why? Because culture was viewed as a tool of ideological support, like the uh, military government uh, had anti-communism and nationalism, and uh, they wanted to use, utilize them to promote more you know, harmonized uh, efforts uh, to uh, pursue economic development. So there was serious uh, censorship and even though the Korean people became uh, a little wealthier, but they still worked very long uh, as we uh, saw, from, uh, saw from the West. So the left-hand side figure shows the development of kind of democracy. So you can see that there was a big jump in 1987 when Korea was democratized, right? So now's the time you can recall the timeline I presented in the very first slide. And the uh, right hand side table shows the censorship score by sector. So uh, the 1970s uh, was the decade of the strongest and the stringent censorship. There's so powerful censorship on album production, broadcasting, creation, distribution, and you know, overall it scored the highest. Right? But after democratization, most of censorship uh, was gone. Right? And the censorship was not limited to domestically produced cultural products, songs, movies, but also uh, the, the restriction was imposed on foreign cultural products, mostly Japanese, because I mean, uh, the Korean government uh, didn't want to uh, be seen uh, as friendly to the Japanese government. So even though they cooperated with, Jap with, with Japan in economy and politics, but in culture, they kind of banned the import of uh, Japanese uh, I mean, movies and songs. And actually many of uh, artists were against uh, the government politically, but they had the same view regarding the restriction of the foreign cultural products because they were worried that once we open our market, Japanese cultural goods will dominate our market, right? So demand restricted, supply restricted. But uh, democratization, it opened up uh, an opportunity because 
you know, uh, democratization usually comes with stronger power of workers. So workers demanded for better uh, working conditions that includes shorter working hours and more income, right? And that was combined with less censorship and regulation and uh, uh, democratic government didn't see culture as a tool of national identity. And they put more emphasis on freedom of individuals. So there was significant demand side changes. And, but so uh, after democratization for the 10 years, there were some changes like uh, you probably know, I'm not sure whether you know this group, but uh, Soteji and uh, uh, friends, they, they were kind of pioneer of uh, uh, K uh, pop idol groups. And they appeared in early 1990s, but uh, it, it did not spread to uh, the entire uh, music industry. And even though the, 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 the industry uh, was gaining more experience, still we had to wait to watch um, very high class uh, music performance or movies. And I believe that uh, the supply side changes that took place in the late, late 1990s was a crucial moment of, uh, to the cultural, uh, Korean cultural industry because I showed you that we had the uh, first peaceful democratic power transfer to the opposition party. And that was coincided with the Asian financial crisis. So the new government saw a lot of potential from culture and to give some stimulus to uh, the culture industries, they needed some, you know, uh, you know some, uh, some stimulus from, from the outside and they were trying to improve the relationship with Japan. So as a, as a result of all these things, the new government decided to open the cultural market to Japan, but gradually, right? So when more uh, Japanese films and music were imported uh, legally, and I entered college in 1999, and I was a big fan of Korean, uh, Japanese movies and, and pop music. But uh, even though I was a big fan of Japanese cultural goods, uh, that led me to more interest in Korean uh, uh, songs and Korean movies because they were also stimulated by you know different styles and different you know uh, the uh, development of uh, the Japanese cultural good and the the, the new government uh, facilitated uh, the cultural uh, producers to make something uh, new and make something good. So I think that was a turning point in, in Korea and there were important industrial changes as well. And I want to emphasize this because this slide can give a kind of impression like, oh, the government uh, intervention or the government support is crucial. And that's true, but that's par uh, partially true, right? Why? Because we learned uh, strong complementarity between ICT and culture. And we saw the nature of quality race. You have to pour a lot of money to uh, give enough experience and give enough, you know, accumulation time for accumulation of, you know, skills to cultural producers. So in Korea, the question was, who ha ha had the resources to jump on quality race, and if. I mean, no big firms uh, have had incentives to pour a lot of money into quality race, how we can persuade them to invest in cultural quality. And the situation uh, was a little bit favorable because, because we, had Asian, uh, we had a financial crisis and we uh, got a lot of uh, rescue funds from IMF and they demanded us some uh, fundamental reforms. And as a, as a result, some uh, media companies were, uh, you know, uh, were, they, they got separated from uh, the uh, big business groups. So before uh, this crisis, media companies I mean, or entertainment companies was a part of big business groups like Samsung, right? So they served 
the entire uh, group's interest and the leadership in culture and media was not their priority. But this changed the situation. And we know a, a an imp very important uh, example, which is CJ. Right? CJ now dominates the Korean culture industry and uh, they they do not inv they they invest not only in commercial films but they invest much in you know independent films and independent songs as well right? and how uh did that uh, become possible because they were disattached from samsung and they set media and uh, culture as the next generation's uh, source of growth so they uh, invested huge money continuously in culture and through trial and errors, they gained a lot of experience, know-how, right? And they even, even though they're uh, in private companies, they balanced uh, between commercial and ind independent cultural areas. And, and then what was the role of public policy? The government didn't uh, jump into the uh, production of uh, commercial cu cultural goods. Instead, they focused on infrastructure like broadband or copyright, and their direct support was uh, concentrated on support for early career or experimental productions and uh, providing uh, public goods such as training and production facilities. So they basically understood that taking control of the culture industry uh, would do more harm than good and they were kind of loyal to the basic you know uh, principles of economics like the government can effectively handle you know pro uh, externalities or production uh, public goods but they sh they didn't touch on the uh, private sector's role right so uh that's uh, one of the most important stories uh, today. But I think now we are facing changing moments. Why? Because we saw some failures and mistakes. There was a Hollywood boom in the uh, mid uh, and late 2000s. And the Korean government wanted to capitalize on it because they saw some industrial potential. So they supported commercial production directly because they wanted to promote, oh, this is Korea, this is dynamic Korea. And they wanted to leverage that for tourism, food, cosmetic industry. I mean, they made some success, but that was not sustainable because there was uh, limited regionally and categorically, right? There was limited to Japan or South Asia, and there was limited to very uh, typical Korean drama or uh, uh, early idol. But recent successes, they show something quite different, right? Why? You know, the uh, Squid Game, uh, the producer uh, says that he was thinking of that project 10 years ago, but there was no investor that would invest in such a kind of, um, you know, uh, radical or uh, I mean, very strange uh, movie or uh, drama series. But now he found a, a great partner, which is Netflix, right? Because of this kind of uh, over-the-top OTT platforms, he found a way to reach out to, you know, people with very diversified uh, demand and diversified taste and very different taste. That's called long-tail long -tail market, right? So the emergence of OTT, I mean, that's quite controversial, but I think it's quite uh, clear that uh, catching up countries can capitalize uh, on the uh, emergence of global uh, platform. So they allowed us to uh, take advantage of diversity and universality. I mean, recent K contents, they do not appeal like what's special in Korea. They don't promote Korean value, right? They speak about, you know, they, they, they speak about uh, inequality, right? And uh, class struggle, gender struggle, and gender conflict. And there are many uh, social issues that are quite common uh, globally, right? And what BTS shows us, 
there is much closer uh, interaction between production and consumption. Fan-based culture is quite different uh, from the early Hallyu, even though there were fans, but you know, it was one way from the stars to the fans. But now consumption uh, leads and consumption facilitate, give stimulus to production, right? So these are changing environment and technological uh, development like OTT, it gave another opportunity to Korea and that is uh, the uh, you know, watershed moment to Korean culture industry because it uh, went up to another stage. Right? So more diversified demand, I mean, that became a source of growth. So the time of demand came after 20 years of supply side factor, right? So, and we know that more diversified demand is a product of openness and value changes and change of generation, right? So I think the cultural policy should focus more on this rather than promoting uh, uh, strategically uh, production of movies, songs, and many things. So this is what I'm arguing these days because this, uh, this shows the distribution of uh, cultural expenditure of Korean people, right? So, uh, because people can enjoy multiple categories of culture, I um, mean, the sum of all uh, shares can exceed uh, 100%. But you can easily see that most of cultural consumption is, you know, uh, skewed toward a movie. So it's not diversified yet. So why is that important? Because uh, in economics, culture is called as experience good, right? So these two uh, diagram shows that uh, two different people, I mean, this guy is born into a family uh, with rich cultural experiences. This guy has an experience of uh, playing instrument uh, and painting and reading books and playing dance in early ages, and he knows what he really likes after experiences. Right? And when he grows up, he will enjoy uh, the type of leisure, the type of entertainment, the type of culture he chose because he chose that. And he will develop his uh, taste over time. But this guy who was born into family with you know, uh, less cultural you know, uh, uh, environment, and he has very limited access and movie could be the only cultural option he has. And he has no other uh, uh, options because he knows uh, nothing about other type of culture, right? So to turn many people like this into this, uh, the government can help these guys to find out what he really likes, but the government should support this guy's first experience with harp, with painting, with dance, and with some other, other traditional uh, culture, right? So the policy is not like helping the poor, right? This has very different rationale. Right? It doesn't mean that God, the government should support the cultural consumption of people permanently, but the, cons the government should provide the chances to experience culture. So the ultimate goal is not like uh, increased cultural c consumption. No, it, the, the goal is to diversify the demand and make strong uh, cultural demand so that our cultural industries can uh, develop further, right? So I'm thinking that this must be the new directions of cultural policy rather than uh, uh, helping the, the producers and creators, uh, just, just, just one-sided way, or giving more money and setting up more uh, cultural facilities. I think we should promote the interaction between uh, demand and production. Right. So, I think I think this is the uh, way to go in Korea, and that uh, gives us another uh, lesson. Uh, I understand the uh, big theme of uh, this uh, symposium is like uh, public uh, diplomacy and. K culture is viewed as a main kind of weapon of uh, public diplomacy. And previously, as I showed here, 
the government was in a kind of hurry and they wanted to utilize the early success in culture. So this is Korea and that was their approach, but it, it was not quite successful. And I believe that these kind of values, I mean, diversity and universality, appeal to universality and more close interactions, which we can see from BTS and their fandom, I mean, they uh, represent the dynamism of uh, cultural, Korean cultural uh, industry. So I think now it's time to synthesize market-based uh, approach and government-based approach. And now we can combine them uh, in a more smart way. And I think that can give some lessons to other countries, uh, including the Philippines and many countries who want to promote culture and at the same time want to have econo take economic values out of it. So this is uh, my uh, short presentation of the uh, development of uh, cultural industry in Korea with the uh, economic you know, inter uh, framework and interpretation. And I believe that uh, more kind of, I mean, live uh, discussions and Q and A's can uh, follow. So uh, thank you for listening. And uh, let's, I'm looking forward to uh, active discussions uh, with you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Lee. Of course, our audience um, couldn't help but um, compare you know, um, the history, the economic history of the Philippines uh, as well, no? uh, as we are as we were watching your presentation. Um, to everyone, you're still tuned in to day one of the eighth Philippine Korean Studies Symposium. To our audience, questions and comments may be posted on the Facebook page and um, official YouTube channel of the UP Korea Research Center. Dr. Lee will join us later, uh, and he will address them during the open forum. Um, at this point, to give his own reflections and insights on Dr. Lee's keynote speech, let us welcome this session's discussant. Um, he is an analyst working in the field of social innovation and development. He graduated uh, Master of Public Policy from the KDI School of Public Policy and Management in South Korea, under the Global Korea Scholarship. At KDI School, he served as local consultant for a study on community-based resilience while completing his graduate studies. He, he also holds a bachelor's degree in broadcast communication from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He has worked as a technical writer and researcher in media, the academe, and government, focusing on issues relating to governance, culture, and innovation. Let us hear from Mr. Ranel Ramcheng. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to uh, verify if you can hear me. Right. Yes, sir. Clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's actually both intimidating and nostalgic to be here uh, um, in a symposium that involves both of my uh universities, uh, UP, UP and the KDI school. Um, actually, listening to Professor Lee's lecture was like a review of one of my favorite classes in KDI school, which was Korean economic development. And one of the key realizations or reflection points I had is that using len the lens of economics in understanding the rise of K-culture drives home the point that the globalization of K-culture and Hallyu and uh, all these related concepts is really multifaceted. Um, particularly, economics is an important lens uh, that can help us understand this particular phenomenon. Uh, and for the students listening here, economics does matter. Um, concepts such as trade-off, um, economies of scale, agglomeration, experience goods, um, in elast uh, elasticity and all that are important. Uh, and so if you still have a chance to, uh, to enroll in economics course, it is worth it. Um, on the other hand, uh, it, it all the, the lecture um, also drives home the point that K culture and the, the understanding of uh, the K phenomenon is a legitimate subject or area for research worth looking into because it taps into a variety of disciplines as well. And so a multidisciplinary approach is important. Um, the approaches and lenses used in media studies, sociology, business administration, international relations, and yes, economics are also important. And uh, I'd like to 
commend the UP Career Research Center for being sort of the house for that and being one of the institutions that leads uh, in this more integrated approach in understanding um, Korean development. That said, uh, Professor Lee provided uh, a, a very good background and he tapped into economic history uh, and gave us that background of how K-culture rose alongside Korean economic development. And by understanding that this phenomenon is multifaceted, it also gives us an, app, an opportunity for nuancing. Nuance is important in our understand, in order to understand uh, the rise of K-culture. Professor Lee gave us that glimpse in his lecture on economic history. And I'd like to even suggest that political economy can be also an important lens for us in understanding this. We can unpack and discover even more stories, right? Uh, Professor Lee's uh, presentation gave us that overview and gave us the, the figures, gave us the facts. And I'd like to say that there's more, there are more stories that we can unpack uh, there are more stories that we can uh, look into and political economy, particularly an approach that looks into the actors and institutions, sort of a historical institutionalist approach, looking at their co different interests and sometimes even competing interests uh, and how they shape uh, K-culture. Um, to borrow from the field of tech and innovation studies, K-culture is an, in, an ecosystem, right? Um, it's, it's not a monolith. It's composed of very different actors and groups. And when we talk about the market, for example, uh, in, in terms of uh, K-content, we realize that there's, there are really different markets and very different players. We can even say there are different segments of it. It's not just about movies. It's not just about music. It's not just about uh, games, for example. And each one may have their different interests. Even the creators themselves, they're not all um, based in big companies or in production houses. They may also include, let's say, um, individual artists, artisan groups, right? Uh, and uh, creators... Um, online, but also offline, right? Um, when we also talk about government, for, for example, uh, interest of the government is not just in terms of, let's say, the ideological side of it, but also could be as a way to uh, promote the country, to pursue, um, to pursue uh, diplomacy, uh, and even to provide economic opportunities. Uh, we see that what happens at the level of the state does have implications on how content is produced and distribute, distributed. And in this respect, talking about actors, focusing on actors, we can even say that government is also an actor within this ecosystem of K-culture production. Uh, and I'm not even just talking about direct intervention, but indirect di interventions to or providing that uh, um, that environment for uh, culture to grow. Professor Lee's presentation also emphasize, also emphasize how demand matters, right? How demand matters in the rise of K-culture. And to tap into what I've learned in MassCom uh, in my undergrad, it's basically audience and taste, right? Um, this is an example also of how, let's say, mass communication can collaborate with economics uh, in order to understand a particular phenomenon. Um, a lot has been done about audience studies, right? Or um, we have a pretty strong foundation on audience studies. But uh, through this lecture, we can see that it's it could be more than that. And there's a lot of room for nuancing. Developing demand or developing audiences would require not just an understanding of what they like, right? Um, and it's a lot more complex than what we think. It's not as simple as forcing Filipinos, for example, to just uh, watch Filipino content, right? We cannot force taste because after all, um, taste could be individual, right? It could depend on an individual, depending on group, depending on class, etc. We also can't ban foreign content either. It's not also a matter of of say having a quota, for example, um, because it would be antithetical 
first, it's antithetical to the free exchange of um, um, creative expression, right? Uh, but also, it it would be detrimental for us as well if we ban um, foreign content outright, because that would uh, that could also serve as an inspiration and in how we in, uh, introduce craft. After all, this is how content is produced, right? The free flow and the strong exchange of ideas can inspire even more works or it can even lead to innovations in different works. So what does it mean for the Philippines, really? Um, we see that it is possible to leverage on creative talents and culturally inspired goods and services and, and these products for socioeconomic development. Uh, here in the Philippines, and to, to our credit as a country, the the Philippine Development Plan of the pre, uh, under the previous term and under the current term uh, mentions about creativity, uh, cultural uh, culture, and their link to development. So that's one way we could see how um, it is within the radar of our development planners and in our development um, priorities. We also have the recently passed Philippine Creative Industries Development Law. Uh, Republic Act 11904. It was passed in 2022 and it is now um, in the works for implementation. And that is another um, another law, that another policy that we can uh, we can look into, scrutinize, and watch out for. Um, but we also need to remind ourselves again that nuance is important, right? Economics is a lens. Um, that may be that could show us what could be applicable to the Philippines. Um, we can use the theories and concepts of economics to understand the supply and demand and that uh, and that and such interaction. But also we can tap into the wealth of knowledge of other disciplines as well. Taste may differ individually, but we can also say that taste can sometimes bring people together. Uh, again, if you're a fan of K-groups, um, you could be a Filipino, um, part of a Filipino fandom and have similar taste to um, fandoms across the world, right? Uh, that's what we've learned uh, in, in some uh, audience studies on um, fandoms. And... But also, in, in the Philippines, one area, uh, one area for nuancing really has a lot to do with our historical, political, and cultural context. Our politics matters, our system of government matters, the way our, um, our, our institutions are set up matters, our access to cultural infrastructure matters, um, our structures uh, do matter. And sometimes the link may not be um, outright, but they are all interconnected to one another. Um, Professor Lee also highlighted that, you know, when, when you talk about culture vis-a-vis -vis development outcomes, it's not just about increasing um, cultural consumption. No, but in the Philippines, for example, uh, our our concerns, uh, uh, as articulated in our national vision called Ambition Natin 2040, uh, culture is also a way to strengthen social cohesion and to and to strengthen our appreciation of cultural diversity, especially because our country um, is multicultural to begin with. And so culture can be a way for us to understand each other. And our cultural industries should uh, reflect that. Um, I also emphasize that an approach of looking at actors and institutions can also give a, can also be liberating in a sense because nuance allows uh, allows us and challenges us even to look into how each actor can empower themselves and empower one another. What can each actor do? What can each actor in this vast ecosystem of cultural production of content production? What can they do? What can creators do to improve their craft? What can businesses do to sell these products while also allowing their artists to actually create their art? What can government do given limited resources and multiple priorities, etc., etc.? A lot of self-reflection, a lot of 
dialogue is important um, when we talk about the development of content production, especially here in the Philippines. Finally, um, I also want to highlight how events such as this one shows the importance of people-to-people -people exchange, knowledge sharing, uh, and cooperation uh, is important. That's also one of the lessons I've learned uh, in KDI school, us being able to talk with each other, amongst each other, and try to imagine the world together um, is important. And that could also, and that's also why um, uh, public diplomacy um, is important, not just for uh, political interests, but also to, to, to forward certain development outcomes. Uh, I mentioned earlier that sitting through the lecture of Professor Lee was like sitting through uh, my Korean economic development class. Uh, and yes, uh, one of our realizations and one of the key points of that class is that there are many different ways to, to <coughs> explain the rise of Korean economic development. But it's not about simply taking that model and, and following it. Uh, in the Philippines, but rather it is an opportunity for us to shape our development story as well, inspired by Korea's development. And so thank you for the for this opportunity and nice to uh, to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insights, Mr. Cheng. Um, to everyone, you're still tuned in to day one of the 8th Philippine Korean Studies Symposium. To our audience, questions and comments may be posted on the Facebook page and YouTube channel of the UP Korea Research Center. Um, Dr. Lee and Mr. Cheng will address them during the open forum, which we are starting right now. Um, questions and comments may be posted on the comment section, as mentioned earlier. And um, we're um, looking at you know, um, some questions and commentaries from our audience, both from uh, YouTube and Facebook, and also anonymous viewers. Uh, we'll try to address them all uh, before the session ends. Uh, first off, we have uh, from Dr. Eric Paolo Capistrano. This is um, a commentary. Um, he agrees with Mr. Ranel's um, discussion. Even individual producers don't rely solely on traditional channels to produce and distribute content. Um, producer na, for example, runs his own YouTube channel for content. Any insights, um, Dr. Lee, about this um, commentary? Well, uh, so is it my, my turn? Yes. <laughs> yeah, first of all, I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Uh, Ranel uh, for the great uh, discussion. Actually, I learned more than I uh, gave to you. <laughs> And uh, thanks for uh, highlighting the importance of kind of nuanced approach, right? And even though I'm an economist, I am uh, I, I find myself uh, often in the opposite side of you know uh, economists sometime and of cultural experts the other time <laughs> because I always emphasize kind of kind of more kind of ba balanced and more nuanced approach. So in reality, and in practice, is quite difficult to maintain uh, this view and this approach and make it work in policy making. So yeah, but, but uh, what I uh, maintain as an economist always is like, we should uh, take a uh, given technological uh, uh, advances. I mean, uh, we can't have, we, we, we don't have any controls over uh, technology and the uh, potentials, the technology uh, unlocks every time, right? So we just saw the uh, comment about uh, the you know new channels like YouTube and Netflix and others. So rather than uh, you know uh, creating some kind of imbalance between our practices and institutions and technology, I think we should find a better way to accommodate uh, new technologies and still promote the creation and pr uh, production of cu uh, cultural contents. Uh, I mean, utilizing uh, the tech, uh, the technical, you know, uh, uh, changes. So, uh, uh, what was the uh, last comment? It, it was about, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Uh, Capistrano uh, talked about YouTube and Spotify, and their uh, revenues might not, uh, you know, come up with uh, the uh, production costs of individual, 
you know, uh, uh, producers. So I think um, nothing is uh, given, and we have to earn it through uh, many trial and errors. I mean, now there are some influential and notable uh, YouTubers, and they uh, cooperate with established entertainers, including K K pop idols. But uh, we also went through uh, many years of trial and errors, and now they learn some something about how to. Uh, utilize uh, the uh, more interactive platform and more, uh, uh, you know, uh, decentralized platforms like YouTube or Spotify. So, and I believe that every country has its own way to uh, leverage uh, the uh, uh, technology. So there is no iron rule and there's no iron law. So, I mean, even though I'm quite against uh, like having quantitative targets, like we should uh, make people go to a movie three times a year, something like this. But probably at some point that wasn't necessary, right? So, uh, and I, I I learned a lot about the uh, I mean, Mr. Ronell's view on the uh, culture industry uh, in the Philippines, and I, I completely uh, agree with him and. Uh, but but I um, and, and this is my and this is actually uh, related to uh, Dr. Uh, Guevara's question about uh, the relationship between Netflix and Korean content creators. Is that a kind of made in heaven relationship, or uh, there will be a short term alliance? I think for the time being and uh, for some time, I think that will be very beneficial uh, to uh, both because. Uh, without Netflix, we wouldn't have found a uh, good, um, you know, consumers, a group of consumers that like our content and give feedback to our uh, producers. But at the same time, well, as an economic historian, I, I know many uh, stories of like early success constrain the future success because they refuse to adapt to changing environment. And recently, some people talk about uh, see i mean we have we we made many successes but look at like a uh, kingdom and look at uh I, I i don't know the english style but what's happening in our school something like that see they're all zombie uh, uh series and we are seeing more kind of commonality between successful uh korean content and well some somebody can say that that's a warning sign because uh, we are utilizing the success uh, given by a new technological breakthrough, which is Netflix. And now we are getting more used to uh, the kind of success formula, right? So uh, that's actually why I emphasize now is the time to diversify uh, the demand base and uh, let people uh, hear uh, some kind of different music and, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Capistrano uh, said he's old, but I'm old as well. Because I, I believe we are in the same age. <laughs> I listen to uh, Satyaji and, and, and some other, uh, not K-pop idols, but I was a fan of other music. But I think that uh, made me a person like uh, this. And I'm still, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm quite open to uh, idol music, but I, I listen to more diversified music and I really enjoy the conversation on this with other uh, foreign uh, colleagues. So, yeah, I, I talk too much. Right? <laughs> no, th thank you, Dr. Lee. And before we reveal each other's ages, <laughs> we now proceed to the, uh, uh, to the next question coming from an anonymous viewer. I think this is um, um, better um, thrown to uh, Mr. Cheng. Um, if we consider domestic environment in the Philippines. I think it's also interesting to discuss more how proactive consumer acts or cultural consumption also had any effect in cultural industry development because it is especially recently described as bottom-up rather than top-down when it comes to proactive consumption. Any comments, um, Mr. Cheng? Uh, yes, thank you for that. And I think I could also jump off from the discussion on uh, yes. diversity of of content, right? Uh, Netflix yes. was able to, for example, uh, to leverage on their business model of being a platform, a streaming platform that also does its own production. But then as what Professor Lee uh, pointed out, you know, this could also lead to 
making things formulaic, right? The zombie formula, for example. Um, and yeah, in, in, in mass communication, that's also a criticism of mass media uh, production as well, the tendency to put things um, into formulas. Uh, so yes, uh, I, I believe in competition in the sense that it drives home diversity. And that, that applies not just in terms of um, who gets to stream what, who gets to produce what, but what is even produced in the first place. Um, for, for this particular comment, uh, the, the focus on this one is the consumer. Uh, more proactive consumer acts. I would assume this would be, for example, um, being able to uh, to support local artists, for example, or let's say lo supporting indigenous um, artists or artists uh, um, of different uh, of gender of different sogi diversity and women artists, etc. That's an example of a proactive uh, consumer. And I'm gonna assume that. Please correct me um, if I'm wrong, but. Um, Yes, I agree that consumer behavior is also it's it's also personal as well, right? It's also a reflection of your personal taste and your personal politics. But I will also um, challenge that yes, we want things bought top down and bottom up because, for example, if I want to support um, certain Filipino content, but there are not that many Filipino content, what's there to support, right? So it's not being rigid. Right. It, I'm, I'm, and, I, and in talking about content and creative expression, we're not talking about rigidity and I'm just focusing on this or focusing on that. And even if you want to be proactive, if from the top down on a structural level, there are not much content that I want to support, then that could be a challenge as well. So it really works both ways. Uh, and, you know, I, again, nuance being that uh, we take away the rigidity that X should be why should be Z? No, right? It's that ability for us to, to experience diversity and to encourage diversity because content in itself is a very interesting um, market in itself because it's not, it, it has, it does follow economic laws, but it's also very personal. It's very ideological. It's direct. Uh, to the consumer who is not just a consumer but also an audience who can also produce etc so yeah thank you mr cheng um to continue our discussion um i would like to um, read um uh, this comment and um, question from dr bubbles azor um thank you very much um dr lee for this very insightful comprehensive and enlightening presentation this gives many of our students and scholars in the Philippines and even Southeast Asia to be clarified about um, the private sector and public sector relationship within cultural industry. There have been dominant discourses how the Korean state played a pivotal role in the success of Korean culture industry. But your presentation tells us a more critical and nuanced approach in understanding Korean culture industry and the varied, at times, contradictory stakes and roles that social actors have and play. And I greatly appreciate this. My question or comment is on how Korean culture industry gradually has been tapping on the more universalistic values rather than presenting very particularistic Korean values. Many Korean pop fans often talk about how seemingly novel and uniquely Korean the Korean cultural goods they are consuming. To what extent is mass customization employed by the Korean culture industry and how mass customization is utilized to present and demonstrate universalistic values than wider and diverse global audience relate to? Well, uh, <laughs> it's an amazing question, but it's a very difficult question. Uh, <laughs> It's very difficult to pin down to a few uh, factors, but from my personal experience, because I am old <laughs> as well, <laughs> and I've been through the changes, I think, uh, well, there, there are many factors, but, but personally, I, I would like to emphasize the importance of early exposure to uh, foreign culture. Like there are famous, you know, movie directors like Park chan Bong Joon-ho, right? But, but we all know that they, they're, they're, they, they were the fans of, you know, some uh, kind of uh, American or European directors 
uh, who made very non-traditional uh, movies. And fortunately, uh, the government support and uh, some other uh, public support gave them chance to experiment, to materialize their ideas that were based on what they saw. I mean, what's going on in Europe and, and the U.S. And they uh, contextualized in a kind of visually, right, and uh, in their movies. And it took some years. Right. So uh, an exposure to uh, other cultures and some kind of patience and continued support that would lead to some, you know, uh, materializing the universal uh, cultural values and identity and making it into a, 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 a attractive uh, cultural products. And the other thing I would like to emphasize is like, you know, we, we everyone everyone would agree that diversity is quite important, but, but we have no concrete ideas of how to promote it, right? So rather than, I mean, formal education is important as well, because, you know, uh, because Korea became more democratic, emphasizing the importance of human rights and diversity. But at the same time, I would like to emphasize the role of uh, critiques, right? Uh, and some of them became quite popular. So they exposed us to different interpretations and different uh, ways to enjoy movies. So I think they uh, contributed also to the emergence of uh, this positive uh, phenomenon. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, the, the next question is um, coming from um, Celsius Watchon. Um, how do you think the K-pop economic microcosm impacts trickle up growth greatly? How about the prospects for a more inclusive economy highlighting human development through K-pop? Um, anyone can um, answer the question? Um, Why don't you give answer to this, Ronel? <laughs> <laughs> oh As an goodness, outside this is... observer. Yes. Oh, oh, it feels like uh, um, uh, a recitation. <laughs> uh, no, but um, um, I think Okay, uh, trying to understand the question is uh, the link between inclusive development um, and uh, K-pop. Um, but I'd, I'd like to step back a little bit and talk about not just K-pop, but really culture in general, right? Economic, uh, culture, cultural production and content production. Inclusive development as a paradigm, we always think of it uh, one of the things that we are being reminded when we think of inclusiveness in the economy is that it's not just about growth, it's not just about income, it's not just about the economic out outcomes, right? Inclusivity means looking at uh, hu our humanity as a whole, right? Well-being, for example. Um, and so what I, I think the role of cultural products, including K-pop, would be, in a way, sort of like a reminder. It on the one hand, the content itself, the subject matters, can spark the conversations that we need. Um, Professor Lee really highlighted that in Korea, especially after democratization, um, that was an opportunity for Koreans to talk about um, different issues, labor issues, class issues, etc. But even here in the Philippines, right, um, our experience during authoritarian regime, for example, it was through cultural products that we got to have this discussion, although it was difficult to have that discussion on the importance of, um, of democracy vis-a-vis -vis growth, vis-a-vis -vis our human development outcomes. And then it's a conversation that we still have um, after that. The point is, um, if you want to talk about uh, inclusive development, yes, everyone has a role to play that. Content, including K-pop, um, could be a vehicle for us to, to, to have that conversation, to and to continuously have that conversation of what does inclusivity really mean. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you for your answer in our recitation, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Cheng. <laughs> yeah, um, yes, um, this is also um, connected to um, um, Julius Martinez's question, um, which you may also um, address uh, later on no? after this um, um, keynote speech. And then, um, we move on to our final um, question for um, this morning. Uh, this is coming from Dr. Jean Franco. Um, Korea's just recently introduced the K-Culture Visa. 
Can you tell us more about this? Will this be for a long for the long term? How is this going to be a win-win situation for both Korea and the migrant sending countries such as the Philippines? Whoa, I uh, actually Googled uh, this while <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> and I found out that there was just uh, announced just last month. So uh, we don't know uh, the actual uh, contents of, of, of this visa. Uh, but uh, what I can say is that, I mean, some of our students at KDI school, they come from like Africa and, and, and recently one of them uh, going back to his own country, he came to my office and asked whether he, uh, he could be connected to one of the Korea's uh, IT entrepreneurs because he wanted to uh, do the business model in his country. And uh, before that, I, I've never thought that this could be a kind of another way of development cooperation. So what I mean is like, this, if this works properly, this can work like that. I don't like uh, inviting students and uh, give them an opportunity to be trainees. I, I don't like that kind of system. But exposing them to the kind of ecosystem of cultural uh, industry, I think that's quite positive and make and that could make our I mean bilateral relationship quite more sustainable. I don't want them to be exposed to like. You know, I don't like the uh, idle uh, development <laughs> training system. I, and I think that's quite, uh, you know, short-sighted. So I, I just hope that this program opens more avenues to uh, people who want to have broad understanding. And, and, and as, as she said, I think that could benefit both, I mean, migrant sending countries and also we can have some new stimulus from the Philippines. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, how about uh, Mr. Chen? Do, do you have um, anything to add? Um, I think, so first, visa. Um, visa issues uh, is, uh, would be a very, uh, visa issues in general are uh, can become personal uh, and become a challenge for many Filipinos in general. So even just the simple student visa. But I, I do agree with with Professor Lee, I think Korea, for example, it took them a while to really figure out what the student visa system is, right? Uh, as for language training, for for higher education, for research, etc. And the challenge is, okay, what do you do with the talent that's already coming into Korea? Um, I agree with Professor Lee's uh, with with Prof Professor Lee's point that you know it's not just about bringing people in into Korea, right? A visa allows that exchange. Um, in and out of the country. Um, I, I think, at least when I was uh, in KDI school, the big topic uh, when talking about migration would be in relation to startups and venture. Um, so the idea of having that, uh, Korea was studying that venture um, visa uh, to allow uh, venture capitalists and startup uh, founders to, from their countries, to go to Korea and perhaps build um, value using Korean technology and then bring it back. So I think that could be another um, perspective into this. Looking at migration or visa in general, not just about people going into Korea, but literally opening up that the, the, the way for exchange between two countries in that particular area. So yeah, maybe the K-culture visa could be something, I also do not have the details about it, but it's something we can look into in the same way that, you know, venture visa, venture cap, uh, startup visa is something we can look into. Or even how Korea is trying to restructure its um, visa immigration system them and they're continually doing that as well in the context of its drive for um development so yeah uh visa is a personal issue and also something that we can look at from the policy lens <laughs> thank you thank you uh mr cheng um perhaps we can entertain one more uh, one final question this is coming from dr eduardo gonzalez the k-pop industry's key driver has been huge government support, unlike Hollywood, which is private sector-led. Will K-pop survive without government support? And um, of course, um, this, this also echoes um, some of the questions about um, the future of K-culture in, in general, um, based on the current um, social historical uh, situation. 
socioeconomic situation in Korea and um, in relation to that, the other um, countries in the world? Well, um, I actually don't agree uh, much with the uh, uh, with the argument. Like uh, it was driven by huge government support. Uh, I think I think they uh, may found some ways to industrialize a production of songs and performance, and they combined them uh, successfully. And I think it's more like uh, the government wants to utilize uh, K-pop uh, success. They want to use it to advertise, like. Expo, uh, Busan Expo 2030, so something like that, and attract Olympics. So I think I, it's more like the other way around. And uh, I think I can, I think this can touch on uh, Celsius' previous question and and touch on my previous comment. Like the ecosystem is important, and critics, uh, cultural critics, are quite important because they raise new issues, and uh, and I believe that that makes it more uh, dynamic. And uh, and it, it it pushes the Korean cultural industry changing uh, uh, endlessly. So as long as it moves on, as long as we can uh, utilize more diversifying uh, demand, I think. I mean, I can't say we will make uh, huge mega hits uh, continuously, but I think uh, it can be it can stay healthy and it can uh, continue to make some small successes. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lee. Yeah, and, and I think this wraps up our um, open forum for uh, today's session. Um, this um, um, keynote lecture titled Rise of K-Culture, History and Economics is, is, is particularly um, interesting, um, not only because, uh, fi uh, on the side of the Philippines, not only because uh, Filipinos are also consumers of K-Culture, K-pop, etc., but also because um, in the Philippines, or at least in the context of the Philippines, um, the definition of, of the term culture is much more different, no? uh, especially because of the um, current situation, particularly on minority, minority communities or minoritized communities, and um, um, the, the roles that culture bearers um, play no? in, 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 um, in the social economic social historical um, situations in in our country so this is a very interesting take off point um especially on topics relating to um philippines and korea um studies um at this point um let me read the certificate of appreciation um for our keynote speaker and discussant uh for this morning's session um, UP Korea Research Center, U, uh, the Korea Foundation, and the UP Department of Linguistics um, Certificate of Appreciation presented to Dr. Chang Kyun Lee for delivering his keynote lecture titled Rise of K-Culture, History and Economics at the 8th Philippine-Korean Study Symposium organized by the University of the Philippines Korea Research Center and the Department of Linguistics at the University of the Philippines Diliman given on the 21st of January, 2023, signed by Dr. Kim Mingbe, OIC Director of UPKRC, and Dr. Maria Cristina Gallego, Chairperson of the UP Department of Linguistics. Let's give, her, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Let me also read the citation for our discussant, Mr. Cheng, um, Certificate of Appreciation, presented to Ranel Cheng for serving as discussant at the 8th Philippine-Korean Studies Symposium organized by the University of the Philippines, KRC, and the Department of Linguistics, UP Diliman, given on 21st of January, 2023, also signed by Dr. Bay and Dr. Galiego. And with that, we, form we formally conclude this morning's session. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we apologize to the questions and comments that were not addressed, but um, perhaps uh, Mr. Cheng and Dr. Lee will be able to answer them um, um, during the op session of our PKSS. Um, to those of you who are, who are tuned in live, you may claim your certificate of attendance after you have accomplished the evaluation form, the link of which will be provided throughout the session. The Google form will be open until 5 p.m. today, January 21, 2023. Thank you once again for tuning in to, the, to this morning's session. And to those 
who will be watching the recording of this installment of PKSS in the future. This is Jem R. Javier, your moderator for Day One Morning Session. We will have a lunch break and afternoon research presentations will start at 1.30 p.m. Philippine Standard Time. You may click the live streaming links to virtually join us again later. Once again, thank you to our speaker and discussant and to everyone who joined. See you later. Kamsahamnida, maraming salamat po.